Ready to go? Yep. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> this will sound weird like me talking to you because you know what's going on here, but obviously we're doing a, a uh, like an instructional video of uh, slaughtering, processing, and then uh, butchering a pig. And we have two pigs. We're going to do one of them today. The timeline will be to kill one, eviscerate it, skin it, get it hung so it can cool for 24 hours. And then tomorrow we will butcher that pig and slaughter the other one. So we'll put this together. I don't know if it'll be one video or a series of videos. Um, so it might not be the same pig that gets cut up in the final like butchery video, but uh, that's sort of the order of operations here. Um, the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna isolate one of the pigs in here while the other one stays outside. And with a uh, 22 Magnum rifle, we're gonna hopefully just one shot, one shot, one kill. Um, if you look at a pig's head where the, the right eye draw a line to the left ear and the left eye draw a line to the right ear, where those lines cross, that's where we wanna put the shot. Um, I like to describe the 22 Magnum as the minimum viable round for this. Um, it doesn't have enough kinetic energy or structural integrity to punch through, like to actually make an exit wound. So um, it'll punch through the forehead, uh, the skull on the forehead, and it will stay in the brain cavity. Uh, as soon as I pull the trigger, the pig will drop and it'll seize. It'll take a moment and then it'll probably go into some convulsions. Um, it has lost consciousness and is effectively dead as soon as I pulled the trigger. And then it's just residual electrical impulses that are going through its body that, um, you know, like whenever you cut a chicken's head off, it still flops around for a little while. Same thing happens with the pig. What we'll do is wait until the most uh, forceful and violent of those convulsions subsides, but not until it's completely um, non-energetic, I guess. And at that point, we will um, make a, a deep incision right across the larynx to sever the jugular vein. The residual mm, little muscle spasms or um, quivers will flush a lot of the blood um, out through that wound. And then the rest of the blood will accumulate in the abdomen whenever we eviscerate it, we'll get a, you know, the, the, the bulk of the remaining blood in the animal out uh, at that point. And then, um, you know, so we'll kill it first, we'll clean it up a little bit, spray it off so there isn't a lot of debris on it, we'll eviscerate it in the uh, trailer um, so that you don't have uh, gravity working against you and causing some uh, difficult uh, pressurization situations. Um, so we'll get it eviscerated and, um, and then we'll hang it to skin it. And then hopefully over the course of 24 hours, it's nice and cold in here, it'll drop down to sub 40 degrees uh, internal temperature and it'll be nice and firm for butchery tomorrow. Okay? You recording? Yes. Okay. All right, here we go. That's all, folks. All right. All right, so we have our pig here. Uh, we have him braced with some like tire chalk so that he stays on his back. And we're just going to hose him off, get off any, you know, dirt and debris off of the stomach and down the legs a little bit, not focusing too much on the trotter itself, um, mainly so that whenever we go to eviscerate it, um, his stomach is free of, of, of dirt and mud and fecal matter, all that kind of stuff, so that we can have like a clean incision. We don't have to worry about cleaning his back up too much because we're gonna be skinning these. Um, so we'll get him cleaned up, all washed off and everything. Then um, we'll eviscerate him in the trailer to get all the, uh, uh, the intestines, the internal organs, stuff like that out. And then we'll take them over and get them hung to start the cooling process as well as uh, start skinning him. Cause that is, that's the big job for today. All right, so our, our pig's cleaned up here. He's, uh, I mean, it's not, you can't eat off of him, but he's close enough. There's not like any mud adhered to his stomach or whatever. So what we're gonna do is we're going to eviscerate him. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna start 
just below the sternum. You can feel like where the sternum ends and it gets into just the soft um, like diaphragm of the stomach. So we're gonna start there and we're gonna make an incision down. We'll go around the penis and down um, into, the, into the hip area. Uh, the, the initial cut is just going through the uh, skin and the belly fat layer. And we're trying to just, just get down to like the membrane that holds all of the viscera in so that we can uh, be surgically precise in cutting through that so that we may only cut through the, the layers um, that we want to expose all of the, uh, the intestines, the, the liver, the spleen, the lungs, the heart, all that kind of stuff so that we can remove those uh, uh, cleanly. If we, if we just kind of like go straight in and down, you're going to rupture all of those intestines. And uh, so this guy was fed yesterday morning and then lured in with some food today. So he probably does have a fairly full like lower GI from what he ate yesterday. Um, so we want to try try hard to avoid rupturing those and having a, an outburst of fecal matter, but shit happens, you know? And if it does, uh, we'll just clean it out. It's not that big of a deal. It's not the end of the world. So we'll go down there, we'll get them open, we'll take everything out, and then we'll work on um, going through the diaphragm to get up into the, the, into the chest cavity where you have the lungs and the heart, um, cut out part of the trachea uh, and pull that out. And then on the back end, we're gonna pull out the, the liver, the spleen. Uh, we'll leave the kidneys intact probably because that's usually how they come from the processor. Um, we'll pull out the large intestine, small intestine, the bladder, and um, then when we get down to the bottom we have to cut around the anus and remove the, the colon from there. And uh, once that's all done we'll make an incision behind each Achilles tendon and we'll get a spreader in there or a gambrel and we'll hoist him up to hang while we start skinning him. All right. Feel a little bit of pressure in there. <laughs> so be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the urethra. Can you see, I don't know if you mm -hmm. can make out that it runs down there to the bladder. I don't so want to cut that. Yeah, we'll cut right along the side of it. And here's the membrane right here that holds the viscera in there. So what I'm going to do is actually pull it up a little bit so that it, hopefully it gives us a little bit of separation. Then I can tuck the point of the knife in there. Worst feeling in the world is whenever you nick your finger whenever you're in this end of the pig. <laughs> Two fingers up, go right in between there. Just eating all night, weren't they? Must have been. Jeez. This is quite the delicate process as well. So what's the temperature of that? Uh, <laughs> comfortable. This would be good ASMR. Yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah. And that thing right there. This is right here is the, the spleen. Yeah. Looks like, it's a, like a tongue. Yep. Yeah. And this right here, this is the uh, call fat. Uh, you got like three main types of fat in a pig. You have your your subcutaneous fat, like your back fat. You have your leaf lard, which will be inside here along the tenderloins, like along the spine and the kidney. And then you'll have this call fat, which is visceral fat that surrounds and insulates the internal organs. And this is like really delicate. If you can get it out intact, it's nice to wrap uh, terrines or pâtés or even burgers or something like that and it'll just like very slowly uh, melt away during the cooking process and impart a lot of nice uh, juiciness and flavor but this one is this is a relatively young pig compared to you know some of the monsters that you get into um, this isn't like quite as developed as I've seen it before but it is really uh, has a good surface area. So we'll see if we'll see if we can get that out. Sometimes it kind of just like gets torn whenever you're pulling out some of those organs or whatever. There's the bladder. 
So we'll be careful with that also. And then we get into the colon down there. So basically we just try to unfurl some of this stuff and free it from the like the, the membranes that are in there, like all this like connective fascia and stuff like that. Just work it out a little bit at a time. And then we might be able to get kind of that lower gastrointestinal mass just into the bucket and then cinch it off and uh, cut it free. It's so clean in there. You expect it to be like a bloody gory mass, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's just all enclosed. Yep. Are those the lungs back there? Uh, this will be the stomach first. Oh, the stomach. lungs will be above Top. the diaphragm yeah. that um, covers here. I don't have any good recipes for spleen. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll just put it in the bucket. But it is kind of cool. So what are you cutting? Um, I'm trying to free like basically the small intestine from the stomach high enough that we don't get like a lot of backflow from the stuff that's in the small intestine. All right, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a void in the uh, large intestines. Yes, where it goes to the colon. Squeeze a lot of that fecal matter back towards what I have out and squeeze some down towards the anus so that we have you know about six inches here of uh, intestine that doesn't it'll there will still be fecal matter inside of it, but it won't be like a mass of it ready to come out. <laughs> And then we'll try to just a nice big bundle, big bundle of spaghetti, all of his anxiety right in there. Let's see if we can find where the bladder has the tubes going into the kidneys. We'll pinch it off below that and try to free the bladder from the rest of this and I'll hold on to it so that we don't get too much of a back backflow of urine. Poop. Look at that. Look at that little water balloon. Drop it in here and there goes the pee. Must have had some B vitamin uh, supplements yesterday. All right, here's our stomach. Look at this guy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy is right. Ah, this south end of the stomach we severed from the intestine and then we just kind of come up here grab a hold of the top and this is this is the part that kind of sucks it's, it's it's a little bit it's adhered to the liver the liver's up above it but what sucks is you got limited space down in here so there's a lot of like holding things putting t tension on it and then cutting blind we're not quite there yet but this is like i'd say 90 percent of the little finger cuts that i end up with doing this come from just the uh, evisceration and cleaning out of the animal because it's it is a tight squeeze but that was that was nice with the stomach now so with things like this if you are so inclined you definitely could clean out those intestines the stomach the bladder all that kind of stuff and use them for casings for sausages or I mean the bladder for a culatello or a south or a stomach for you know large format whole muscle cures or whatever but you can also just buy them like clean and salted and dried and you know for 20 bucks you get a few <laughs> and you know they're clean to perfection they're clean much. enough i mean you open them up <laughs> they don't smell like that yeah. <laughs> so it's like hey yeah. Let's uh, let's do that. All right. So we have our um, liver back here. We're going to pull out, and then we're going to be we're kind of like incise the. Some people will pull the um, the gallbladder off and try to just cut the bladder. Um, since I don't really care how much pork liver we get from this, I just cut the chunk of the liver that the gallbladder is stuck to, uh, because that you have less likelihood of spilling bile into the cavity which isn't that big of a deal because you just rinse it out. But if you can avoid doing it to begin with, that is better. So what we'll do is, uh, yeah, we'll grab the liver and try to work it out. It has a nice, it, I think, I believe it's connected to some of the fascia that adheres it to the lower part of the diaphragm. And then I believe we've already um, freed it from the big blood vessel that 
supplies it and takes away i don't know i get you know your liver filters a bunch of stuff out of your blood so the blood has to flow into it and flow out of it and did you hear that i heard that <laughs> that was um the membrane that basically opened the uh area into the uh the, what would be the thoracic cavity where the heart and the lungs are. But here's our, oh, our liver, it's very slippery. And then that little robin egg connected there is the gallbladder. And we'll just cut this whole like lobe of the liver off. Or actually, you know, cause some of this is like, what are we gonna do with it? Are we really gonna, we're gonna make a, you know, three pound liver pate and enjoy it? Probably not. And we have a whole other pig. so. Uh, I'll take the gallbladder off just to show you how I do it, but I'm not keeping this liver. I might, I might pull it out. I mean, later. chickens are. Yeah, we give it to the chickens um, or something. But yeah. like this, I am not going to. So our chickens this. will eat it. I am not going to consume this. <laughs> Pork liver is so like calf liver, or beef liver is great. Is great for um, just cooking and eating. Pork liver is almost. I mean, I'm not going to say exclusively, but almost exclusively um, just added to pâtés and terrines and stuff as like a as a particular flavor, as a uh, a particular um, texture that you're looking for, you know, kind of like fortifying a pâté with some liverness. But there it goes. And then let's see if we um, split this open and see that uh, antifreeze come out. Oh, that, some, sometimes it's super like blue green. That's nice and yellow. I don't know if that's good or bad. Like if the color of the bile is uh, indicative Should of anything. Should you wipe but, your knife off now? <laughs> yeah, I'll give it a spray. All right. Now, if you look down inside here, our kidneys, one here, one there. Um, you can remove those at this point if you want. But every time, like if you take a, a pig to a slaughterhouse and have it processed and, and skinned or scalded or whatever, usually it'll come back um, kind of split right down the middle. And <laughs> that, <so> kidney, <laughs> that kidney will just be stuck into the leaf lard on the sides of the, um, of the cavity. So uh, I'm going to leave them in there for now. Uh, we got to go through the, um, the musculature of the... Uh, diaphragm here which we've we've already like torn it open but then there's it's it's connected up at the top we'll slit it up and then we can remove the lungs which I've got one of them sitting right here in this pool of blood um, but we can remove the lungs and then I can feel that the heart is uh, just up here above it it's like a mass the heart is the one where um, uh, I cut myself most often because it's way up here behind the rib cage. You kind of have to go in and grab it and then come up blind and, and free it from whatever it's uh, connected to. So we'll lay the knife down here. Actually, we'll, um, we'll open up this uh, diaphragm more. Ooh, yeah. Come on, lungs. Here we go. And at this point, these things are all safe that if you stab them, it's not right. I, you know, I was just thinking anything. that I, I should. Yeah, I said that that like if you cut into the lungs, you're not spilling anything out that you don't yeah, want to come in contact. It's more below stomach and below. Yeah. Well, no, that's not true. The liver. Yeah. The well, liver I mean, the liver, even that was a little bit below the stomach mm -hmm. and that, you know, you can it's not like you don't run a big risk of rupturing the gallbladder just getting the liver out so gotcha. it's not that big of a deal and what's neat is so like the liver is very dense and heavy and the lungs are very floppy and light like they feel like they're made out of it well they are made out of a different material but like styrofoam compared to like rubber or something and um there are like old timey recipes for things that have an ingredient called the lights and i believe that the lights refer to the lungs because they are like physically lighter than other organs. Uh, and then this, oh yeah, that one comes out easy since I had that decision there. But it is remarkable how just springy and, and light they are. Like it weighs nothing. <laughs> and then you do have a lot of blood pooling in here. Um, from when it died, you know, a lot of that blood just kind of accumulates in the chest, in the heart. And in the cavity there, but we got the heart has a little membrane around it and here it comes. There it is. And there's our beautiful pig heart. Get some of that blood clot off of it. And 
Uh, so with a pig heart, I mean, edible, obviously. Um, there is a, like a cured product, an Italian one. What's it called? Um, uh, it's basically you dry cure it, cold smoke it, and then press it. And I cannot remember. The, it's, a, it's a long string of Italian words. Um, but it, you know, it's reasonable. It's, it's edible. It's good. It's delicious. But uh, this will be for Yeti Spaghetti. He'll enjoy this heart. We've got the esophagus up here. I'm going to try to remove some of that because before we get down and work on the butt here. But once we hang this up and we spray it out, uh, we're, we'll be hanging it by its back feet. And as you're spraying out the cavity and everything, a lot of that liquid will just gravity will pull it down into the chest cavity. So we want to have um, like a clear path for that to exit and drain out. So we got to remove like the larynx, the esophagus, and just uh, pro there's probably some clotted blood in that wound from from the neck. So we'll work on that here. I'm gonna take uh, I'm not gonna take my coat off. I gotta roll my sleeves up. I gotta go up to my elbow. <laughs> it's kind of remarkable, like how distinct the um, what would you call it the texture or the you know the feel of the of the esophagus and the larynx is. It feels like it's made out of plastic. Like it's like a plastic, um, like a corrugated plastic tube. That's what it feels like. Straw. Yeah. And so we know that this is severed inside. Uh, well, mostly uh, it's punctured. Let's let's go and actually cut that part off. If I, I got it ahead of the larynx, uh, I thought because there's this bulbous, like the um, the voice box here, mm -hmm. uh, being able to get a grip on it might be able to pull it out this way rather than pulling it into the cavity no. but there's some there's muscles and connective tissue so i'll just work my fingers around it see if i can free it oh there it goes nice nice look at that and then if you were a real freak you could probably blow some toots through here and see if you can if you can sort of macro in on that these are the vocal cords it's like a reed you got the two sides that'll vibrate against each other whenever he talks yep. very cool so there is a clear, like, like my fingers I, are basically, I can, I can join my fingers together and lock them. Um, I just want to maybe clear up a little bit more of this flappy membrane stuff that's in there. Because once he hangs up, that stuff can kind of like settle down and create a, a plug that'll prevent. Yeah, you're just making a flow. Yeah. Like a clean flow. And plus when he's hanging, we can also just go straight down in and, and dig some of that off. So yeah. that's working nicely. All right. Now... The delicate, the delicate end. <laughs> what we'll do here is we'll continue cutting down till we get down to the anus and and into the the muscles of the what is essentially the the hips, the pelvis, whatever. Um, I will have to clean up and grab a cleaver to split that pelvic bone so that we can cut around the anus and then pull the colon out because it, it basically it, it goes in and it's going through like a tunnel of bone if it were a female kind of like through the uh, the top of the birth canal essentially um out obviously up a little higher but um it's not like like if you, you can't pull it out this way and it's difficult to pull it out without splitting those bones so we're going to do that in a moment all right so usually i like to use a rubber mallet for this but i can't find any of mine because Ten-year-old boy. <laughs> Ten-year-old boy has taken it somewhere. But I can use a regular hammer. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lay the mallet down um, into that bone union and that that we're through. Got to get way down to his butt. And you're basically cutting his tail out, right? Um, tail, yeah. The tail, uh, we usually just cut it off whenever once it's hanging. I'm gonna because I'm gonna oh, be a little, go I'm gonna go it. down okay. around the butt oh, and gotcha. then pull all that I out. I thought you included the tail. No. Nah. At this point, I can move these chalks out so we can spread his uh, groin open a little bit more. Ugh. Just like that. Right. Very clean operation. Very clean, very clean. <laughs> then we'll just, now he doesn't, doesn't need his penis anymore. So 
we'll just remove that. And there we go. We've got a pig that's mostly empty of the things that we want it to be empty of. Next stop, we'll be back over to the garage. We'll get them hung up. We'll, we'll hook up to that outside hose bib on the house. Take this uh, over and get some water there. All right, so what we're going to do here is just make an incision behind the Achilles tendon on each side, and then our gambrel hooks can go in there. Uh, and that those tendons are strong enough to hold the body weight of the animal. So once we get that in there, what we'll do is <clears throat> probably disconnect the trailer from the quad and use the winch on the quad over one of the rafters to pull him up into a hanging position. So basically, we just puncture through from one side to the other without severing the actual um, tendon. And then we can um, thread that hook through there, go through on both sides. And it always seems like it should be easier than what it is. <laughs> like just, it's you like just an gotta ear go piercing. Through. Yeah. <laughs> So that side went around. in real easy, but then the other side obviously will give me a hard time, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. yep. nice easy breezy, simple. beautiful cover girl. All right, that's that. All right. So since we didn't we didn't rupture any intestines or have any spillage from the from the bladder or the stomach or the gallbladder or anything like that. So it's just a quick rinse inside as opposed to, you know, trying to flush out contamination or whatever, but it's remarkably clean in here. Uh, and our, our drainage system is working very nice, but see, um, there really isn't any debris. You got a nice, uh, I mean, w once we, uh, we will skin it, um, and then we'll split it with a sawzall coming right down the middle. We might take some of this membrane and stuff out before we get to that point. But the main thing, because it is a job, is getting it skinned out today. Because um, like, so temperature-wise, we woke up this morning, it was like 32 degrees. It will go up to 54-ish or something today. Um, but here inside of this building, um, there, there'll be a lag. There'll be like a couple hours where it'll still, the temperature will be increasing here, but it won't get to that ambient outside temperature um, because once it hits the peak around two o'clock this afternoon at like 54, it's going to crash pretty, um, pretty rapidly back down into the uh, mid to low 30s. So overnight, it'll be hanging in here at, uh, you know, below refrigeration temperature, like just above freezing. So hopefully tomorrow, um, it, it'll be a lot more firm and um, I don't want to say rigid or, or but it, right now it's going to be really floppy. Once you lose all that, um, like the blood pressure, whenever they're alive, you know, whenever they feel solid, um, they get real, um, almost like gelatinous. And that's why we want to chill it down for that 24 hours because uh, you could, I mean, we could skin it out and butcher it right now, but it would be a lot more work and the cuts wouldn't be as clean. You know, whenever you have nice cold fat, cold meat, um, you know, you can go right through and it, it holds its shape really nicely. So, so we'll get started with this. So as far as skinning goes, you and I will both have a knife. We'll start up here probably, um, uh, at, like, I, I guess this would be like the inner thigh and make like an incision out this way and then try to get hold of a flap and just work that skin off. Um, the belly is difficult because it is so floppy. There isn't like a lot of um, mass behind it to like anchor yourself as you're trying to get it, get the skin off. Um, but then like the back is nice. We get down, we're gonna bring it basically down to where we made the incision on the neck to drain uh, the blood and everything. We'll be right behind the ears, go across. That'll be what we do today. He'll still have skin and fur and everything on the trotters, like down to the wrist basically uh, the hind trotters, um, not as high as where we came through with the gambrel. Uh, and then what we'll do whenever we actually butcher it down is any of that um, shank that we want, uh, we'll just skin it out once we've actually cut it off of the animal. But uh, for right now, it's just tedious, just a little, a lot of little, little tiny knife work for a while. Um, but it wasn't bad. The, the pig that I did this week for those other people, um, skinning it, I think, 
it was maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half, and it, uh, it, it went really well. So that's that. <laughs>Got them all mostly skinned out here. Down to just behind the ears, basically the same, uh, what would you call it, like the equatorial uh, distance down as the incision that we did in the neck. All right, guys, welcome back. Um, I don't know if I'm in frame, I'm using the uh, uh, tripod today, and I know it was pointed at uh, the part of the pig that I wanna focus on right now, but um, you know, we finished, killing the pig, uh, eviscerating it, and skinning it yesterday. And then we left it hang in here overnight. And, uh, you know, this morning when I woke up, I don't know, it was around 6, 6.30, the um, uh, outside temperature was 27 degrees Fahrenheit. So we know that it got nice and cold overnight. Um, the pig itself is nice and firm. The fat is dense. It's not like uh, glistening or melting because uh, you know, really good pork fat can, can melt uh, at or slightly above room temperature. So uh, this will be a lot easier to cut up um, with, that, uh, with that, that stiffness, that toughness, that density of the, of the muscles and the fat. What we're gonna do right now is uh, we're gonna remove the head and then we're gonna split this into the two sides. Uh, for the head, uh, most of the cut will be done with a knife because there's very thick musculature uh, behind the head in the, at the top of the shoulder, the copa muscles, um, and around the neck. The only thing, I mean, obviously, if you think about uh, anatomy, the only thing holding the head on, aside from the fat and muscle, and tendons and sinew and all that kind of stuff is uh, the spine, you know? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the cut with a scimitar, which is a very, I mean, not very, relatively long knife. But what this allows me to do is make like a smooth cut. And if I start here and I draw the knife through, I can get um, through the thickest part of that um, musculature with like a single stroke and then I can come in at an angle and do another stroke and whatever it's just it avoids a lot of sawing and a lot of shingling of the of the meat that is connecting the head to the rest of the body there we'll get down to just the um, just the spine and then we'll use the sawzall real quick to uh, cut through that now um, I'm not sure exactly how close we'll get to the first vertebrae uh, in the stack there. I mean, ideally, if you can take the head off at that first vertebrae, um, that basically um, preserves the maximum amount of pork behind the head for you to make use of. Uh, I believe that first vertebrae is called the atlas bone. And it makes sense if you think, uh, you know, Greek mythology or whatever, atlas being the guy holding the earth on his shoulders. And if you perceive the world uh, with your brain, like all the sensory inputs come in, but they're all processed inside of your skull. Essentially, the entirety of your um, of your interaction with the world or your 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 conceptualization of reality of the universe happens inside your skull. So that first bone uh, holds your entire world uh, atop it. <laughs> fun, right? All right. So let's get into this, uh, taking this head off. And I gotta, you know, I gotta try to just do the job and not worry where I am, if I'm in frame, out of frame, if I'm blocking something or not. You can fill in the, any missing frames with this. So what we're going to do is we're going to come across, I'm going to start uh, behind the head, like right at the skin level and get in there nice and deep. We definitely don't want to get into the jowl. So we're just going to follow the same cut all the way around. And then once we've, um, uh, once the only thing left is the uh, spine, then we'll get in with the sawzall for that, okay? Try to hold him steady so he doesn't start swinging like a pendulum. And you always see like in media, like horror movies and different things of just taking the head off real easily. And yeah, maybe with humans, I don't know. But with pigs, faux show. It is a job. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen by accident. Nobody loses their head through just an errant swipe. 
we are very close to being at the end here. There we go. Basically through that entire, uh, what would you call it? That's not a wound channel, but that slice, the only thing I can feel now is the spine. So we'll get in there and cut that. The last pig that I did, the head came off real easily. And I just caught it by the ear. I don't expect it to be that easy again, but we'll give it a shot. We'll hold him by the ear. It's really hard to use that one-handed. See, normally if I use two hands, I can kind of guide the, the blade right into where I want it to be, but then I don't have a hand free to keep him from swinging. And I also don't have a hand free to hold the ear. So, what we, what we lose in control, we make up for potentially catching the head. So let's see if we can do it this way. Oh, look at that, perfect. Came right off. Also, check this out, behind the head, just how big and thick all that muscle is around there. It's incredible. I actually think we got really close to the, to the atlas bone there. We'll find out when we, take, when we clean the head up. And yes, it's very heavy. Everything, everything about them is heavy and dense. All right, so now we're gonna split this guy down the middle. Uh, I'm gonna start by cutting through the sternum and basically uh, freeing the front of it, you know, go straight down through the throat in the, in, the, in the sternum here so that we can make one cut down the middle of the spine. And we'll try to get that as, as centered as possible. Um, the one that I did uh, on, what was it, Thursday, Friday? Uh, Friday, Friday and Saturday. Um, that one <clears throat> came off like remarkably symmetrical, but sometimes, sometimes, you know, you, you find a groove and it, it goes on an adventure <laughs> on the way down. All right, so we're gonna, and again, we'll try to keep them from swinging too much, get, get them caught in here. The, um, the cut on the front, like through the sternum, is not really as important to be super straight as the one down the spine, but it's also easier to cut through the sternum. So we'll see how we do there. Not bad. Again, he's swinging a little bit. If you have a couple extra people with you, it can make it really easy because they can hold it steady and they just have to stay out of the way of your blade. Not bad, not bad. Um, we did, you know, we have a long sawzall blade. So when we were cutting through the sternum, the end of it was uh, rasping along the, uh, the ribs, but that's no problem. That's not gonna cause any issues. And you can see kind of the way he's hanging here. Um, obviously this side on, it would be my left, your right, slightly heavier than this side, uh, just by, the way you have that scale action going there. All right, so that is splitting, and now I have to re recruit some help from my wife to transfer you know, one side to this table and one to the holding table over there, because once you pull one side off of this gambrel, um, the other side will drop precipitously due to the uh, change in weight distribution. All right, so we need basically one person to lift off the one side while the other person catches <laughs> the, uh, the opposite side. All right, here we go. We have uh, half of our pig laid out here. The other half is on a table over there. So we'll work through this one half at a time. Ah, let's see. Um, first thing we need to do is, so we have half a pig here. It's still roughly pig shaped, right? You have the, uh, the southbound end of the northbound pig over here. You have, uh, the head end there. Uh, the easiest way to break this into cuts that would be remin or not reminiscent, but recognizable as food is <clears throat> uh, following. Like I like to follow a methodology that's kind of um, from a British and French tradition of, of butchering an animal uh, into primals, and we'll do three primals. The um, 
the, the shoulder, the loin, and the ham primal. If this was a Spanish sort of butchery demo, uh, chances are they would, do, they would do the shoulder primal, they would do the loin primal, but they would split the loin and take a lot of that lower belly portion off to go into various types of embutidos and chorizos because um, uh, on the Iberian Peninsula, it seems like they had a lot less of a, of a bacon type of culture than you did in your like Anglo uh, cultures and your Breton uh, cultures, like Fr France and England, France and England specifically. And then of course that, um, that went across the Atlantic with the colonies and, and was uh, installed in America. So that's sort of what we're gonna do is we're gonna break this into uh, the shoulder primal, the loin primal, and the ham primal. Now, one of the things I get a lot of questions about is knives. Uh, what, what specific knives, uh, brands of knives, how many knives, all that kind of stuff. What are you looking for in a knife, that kind of thing. Uh, my default recommendation for people um, if you're looking to buy some uh, production-oriented uh, knives, something that you're just going to use for the vocation of breaking down meat, is to use something like Victorinox or Dexter or FDIC or something like that, kind of like commodity commercial knives. The reason being, particularly with v Victorinox, just because their prices are more um, uh, familiar to me, is that you know if you buy a $30 Victorinox boning knife or breaking knife or chef's knife or something like that, you're getting for the most part a $30 knife. Whereas if you go up market uh, into knives that cost a couple hundred dollars a piece, if you buy a $200 knife, it will be better than the $30 Victorinox knife but it won't be $170 better. You know, like it'll be better, but the, the gap between what you're actually paying and the quality of the knife itself is going to widen. So now I am not using Victorinox. I have a smattering of different brands of knives, um, but the style of knife they use is, um, uh, it still remains pretty consistent with me. Um, like I always tell people that like I could I could break this pig down with a paring knife if I had to. It'd be it would take a little while longer. The cuts wouldn't be very clean. It would be inefficient. But you could totally do it. Like you don't necessarily need anything beyond that. But what I like are basically two main knives to use. One is a semi-flex boning knife, which you can see that the um, the blade has a little bit of give to it, and that's really nice for whenever you're um, coming in around bones and stuff like that. There's actually two joints that will be taken apart that really illustrate the, the value of having a flexible uh, boning knife. And I, and I guess this one's probably, what is this, maybe an eight inch boning knife, I think. Um, usually you'll get them in six inch or eight inch. I'm sure you can get really super long ones, you know, 10, 12 inches, whatever, but an eight inch semi-flex, boning knife is real nice. And the brand of this one is Schmidt Brothers. Secondly, um, and this is where, uh, you know, I ha I, I'm using one just because this is sort of my, my, uh, my default, like what I, what I fall back on, is a bullnose breaking knife that has a um, nice raised hilt on it there. Um, the reason I like the bullnose is this, this curve up here gives you like a little bit more cutting um, surface so that whenever you're pushing through a big piece of meat, you don't have to go back and forth so much. You can kind of push in and then in one smooth stroke, get a nice cut there. Um, having the, the raised hilt in the back is nice because listen, whenever you're cutting in your kitchen, you're, you're with your thumb and forefinger index finger, you're gripping the knife and then wrapping these behind the hilt and that gives you nice control there. Once we get into like cutting up a pig, this is gonna be covered in, in fat and grease. Your hands are gonna be wet and greasy. You can't hold the knife like this because you're gonna slide very easily. So a lot of times you are you know, just gripping it like this behind the hilt. So having a little bit of mass there to stop your hand from sliding forward is really nice. The two grips, I mean, you're like this, and I don't remember what this is called, um, but alternatively the pistol grip um, like this for whenever you're cutting through. Usually you wouldn't be doing that with a breaking knife. Um, that, that grip is more um, with the boning knife. And you know, this is a polymer handle, very slippery, but very um, durable. Uh, so it has pros and cons. The wooden handle has the benefit of as it gets wet and as you're using it, 
the, um, the wood grain swells up and it gives it some more texture for some grippiness. If you go back to those um, uh, Victorinox style knives, the handle is, I believe it's called Fibrox, which is like a, uh, a textured plasticky sort of uh, material, real nice for anti-slip and all that kind of stuff. But you know, this, the stainless steel of those knives are a little bit softer. They have a lot more like chromium and whatever the other additives are. So you have to put an edge on them. You have to hone them uh, very uh, often, you know, to keep them nice and sharp. Whereas you get into harder, harder steel. The Schmidt Brothers is nice um, hard steel. Um, and it was this one, a Henkel, oh, this is a Wusthof. Um, so the, the, you know, the steel on those are going to be a little harder, uh, more rigid than what you would get on the Victorinox. So they'll hold an edge longer, but this nice, um, uh, Dexter, uh, diamond, uh, steel for, for honing. And you can, you know, just run your knives over this a couple times as you're moving through and you can, you can set it down on the cutting board or the cutting surface and go down. You can hold it and do it this way. You can do back and forth, whatever. Uh, we won't have to do it too much because we're only cutting one pig and, um, uh, you know, these knives have, have just been honed recently. All right. So, um, <clears throat> one thing, uh, oh yeah, I guess if I'm talking about knives, I should also talk about the bone saw. I believe that I'm using here is a 21 inch, uh, hand bone saw and you know you can get ones that are you can get ones that are a little shorter than this and then you can get ones that are a little longer i like to err on the side of longer because um it the hardest part of you know sawing aside from just getting a groove and getting into a rhythm where you're actually cutting through the bone and not catching it and just moving everything around is jamming this front point against something ahead of you. So the longer this is, the more cutting surface you can kind of just make small passes like this or big long swipes. But we are gonna use this very sparingly. Um, we're basically just going to use this to remove um, the bottom portion of the rib cage and the chine bones off the top. We'll also cut off the lower parts of the trotter uh, just because it is, it is easier, but aside from that, you know, a lot of butcher shops or whatever, they'll have a nice big bandsaw and they'll take big hunks of pork, you know, pork shoulder or whatever, run it across that bandsaw and just make rectangular shaped pork roasts or, you know, trimming up the hams. Uh, we don't have to do that. We are going to take this animal apart using basically just the knives by finding uh, particularly, you know, between the, the shoulder and the loin and the loin and the ham, a point where uh, it's easy to separate one section from the other. So we're going to start with that now. What we're going to do is we're going to take this um, shoulder uh, primal off of the loin primal. And to do that, what I like to do is find uh, between the fifth and sixth rib. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. So yeah, that, that'll that just work there. Uh, between five and six. The reason for that is if we follow the the space between those ribs down it comes out into the belly behind the sternum the sternum bones end right here and then we're going to be coming in right here so as if we cut through and we slice down everything from the spine down will be separated from the rest of the animal then we just have to cut through some of the meat of the loin up here and the last thing that is holding the front of the pig onto the back of the pig is um, those vertebrae. And then at that point, you know, when, when that's the only thing left intact, you just lift this front part, hold this down, right like that, just a chiropractic motion, like that. It'll snap it, you might have to cut through a little, couple little tendons, and then that front loin will come off. So let's do that now. So we're gonna just come in near the top of the loin, and if you, I don't know, I don't know if this is in frame, but my knife comes through here. So I know that I'm, I'm not hitting anything but muscle all the way back. And then as we run down through the bottom and right up through the, uh, that way, I'll switch to my bullnose just to have a little bit more, um, blade surface push through in both directions. And just with a little bit of a wrench action. We've uh, pretty much separated the shoulder from the loin. So like I said, I put my hand right here, give it a point of a little bit of leverage and lift the, this up and it pops right across. We got about 
a half inch of loin muscle connecting one part to the other and bada boom bada bang comes off real nice and then if you look at the uh the cross section there you can see where our loin starts where you know the our pork chops will run down the back the the, the vertebrae there and then we have a nice slab of pork belly um, starting on the outside of the ribs and then we have the ribs on the inside so we'll we'll break down that primal shortly but what we're going to do here in the loin is we're going to remove our kidney. Our kidney stuck up here in the, in the leaf lard. We're going to remove some of this fascia that's on the inside of the cavity. And then we're going to remove the tenderloin um, from inside of the, uh, whatchamacallit, of the vertebrae there before we remove the ham from the rest of the loin. And I'm just trying to pull this uh, kidney out without uh, without all that membrane and and call not call fat um, leaf lard and stuff attached to it now there's your kidney um, technically edible not particularly good you know you could you could chop it up add it in with a bunch of other meats and seasonings um, cook it in in a in like a meat pie with a flaky buttery pastry crust or whatever or you can simmer it in water and give it to the give it to the dogs and they will enjoy it because that's really, that's really the best, the best thing to do with some organ meats, you know? Um, the reason why those organ meats usually are not quite as, uh, quite as good as the steaks and chops and, or, and roasts and stuff like that, stuff made out of uh, muscle, is that, you know, muscles have fibers that run, you know, some are par parallel, some are perpendicular, but it gives it a particular mouth feel that is um, uh, a texture that is meat. Whereas your organs, like your spleen, your lungs, your kidney, your liver, stuff like that, rather than being fibrous, you know, with muscle fibers, it's like, a, it's almost like a matrix of, of cells, like a, in a beehive sort of pattern. So whenever they cook, that matrix sort of collapses a little bit and it just gets dense and chalky because it, it, it doesn't have the muscle fibers to give it that structure in, in your mouth. So it just sort of smears on the palate and it's, uh, that can be off-putting to some people. And then there's the, the flavor aspect of it too. I mean, your kidney is essentially a filter for urine and uh, what do you know? It uh, doesn't. It doesn't taste as good as pork shoulder. <laughs> Imagine that. So uh, we're just gonna clean up some of this stuff so that we don't have to do it once the smaller pieces come off. Some of this will end up in the trim for sausage. Probably most of it will. You know, like this fat here and the glands that are in there. It's not bad. Some of this stuff we can get rid of. <clears throat> we can cut, we can actually just like uh, fillet this meat off of there so it can go into the sausage, but this stuff here will be discarded eventually. All right, let's get some of this blood stuff out of here. Okay, so now we're gonna pull out the uh, tenderloin, which is just like this stabilizing muscle that sits right up against the ribs inside of the spine. And, you know, this is, on beef, this would be like your, your tenderloin. Well, I mean, it's the tenderloin on pork too, but the cuts would be like your Chateaubriand or your filet mignon, stuff like that. It's actually a grouping of two muscles, the psoas major and the psoas minor. Pull it off here and take a look at it. All right, and we'll, we'll clean it up a little bit. But the psoas minor is like this little chicken finger type thing that runs along one side. You can see that it is distinct from the other one, but it's joined up with like a little bit of a, like fascia material in there. But we can get a lot of this crap off and then we'll have a nice clean pork tenderloin to prepare, maybe cook it whole on the grill, add a little bit of flavor to it. It doesn't have a lot of flavor so you often see these marinated and things that have a lot of salt and sugar and acid, like a teriyaki glaze type of thing. My hands are very cold and I don't have very, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep them clean and cut free. 
So sometimes when I'm holding something oddly, it's like, this isn't how I would cut this if I had cut gloves on that allowed me to like really cinch down and, and anchor um, a piece of meat against my fingers. You know, it's very slippery, but I'm not gonna be using any cut gloves today because I can't find them. <laughs> so, uh, so some of, the, some of the movements will be a little awkward. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove the loin from the ham. Uh, what we're gonna do is if you follow this um, spinal column down, it gets right here to the hip, and then it kind of makes like an S curve up and out into the coccyx, which would go off into the, into the little piggy tail. At this last vertebrae here, if we come in underneath and kind of up at an angle, just like this, then there is nothing between here in the bottom to get in its way. And what you do is you have the same sort of situation as you did on the front of the animal where you can pop this back. Actually, I, it was starting to pinch my finger, so I moved it. But um, let me just stick my arm in here and, ow, it is pinchy. There we go. And there's our ham primal off. All right, so we're gonna flip our, uh, belly over. See, we got real deep into um, the skinning here and took a big hunk off. So we'll, we'll square this up and uh, we'll basically take this part of the belly uh, for bacon. A lot of this will go into trim and then we're going to cut some pork chops off of our loin there. But first, let's get all this stuff off the inside that is just going to go into our sausage bin. Cut off the bottom portion of our belly here. Now, one of the two times we're gonna use our bone saw, I mean, well, I guess it's gonna be more whenever I cut those trotters off, but we, we wanna remove the lower portion of our ribs, kind of what are the spare ribs. By coming right through here, we just score a mark and then we'll use the bone saw to cut through those ribs. And the, and the saw is just for cutting through the bone. So what we wanna do is we'll kind of go at an angle so that we're going through like one or two bones at a time. And then as it sinks in and we got to cut through the last three or four, we'll go parallel with the table. We'll cut through that. Then with the boning knife, we'll come in underneath and we'll pull this um, slab of pork, uh, of, of spare ribs off of there and set those aside. And then we'll come up and do the chine bones right after that. So this is a little awkward because you, you, you gotta hope you get some good purchase on there. And then we're through. That was actually really easy. I'm sure we'll have more, more trouble with the uh, chine bones up at the top. So now we have this little bottom section of rib that we can come in parallel to the table, use the bone as like a guide for holding the knife uh, parallel and then pull it and just unzip it just like that. Now, if we were doing spare ribs, like for a grocery store, we'd probably leave a lot of that belly attached to it. So you'd have like a big raft of meat, um, but I prefer to have more bacon. And then we have like a little cartilaginous floating rib right here we can remove. And we're just gonna put that into the, into the trim pile because we'll come back later and actually cut all the meat off of that. But, <clears throat> so fun, fun etymological uh, fact. Well, not fact, I don't know if it's a fact because I heard it sounded good. I incorporated it into my own head cannon as uh, it being true. But why, why are those lower rib sections called spare ribs? They're not extra, you know, it's not like a spare tire in case of emergency, break glass for extra ribs, anything like that. In fact, I traced the etymology of that term back to like the, maybe the fourth or fifth century AD when the Roman Empire is kind of collapsing and 
crumbling more or less, being uh, exploited on its borders from opportunistic tribes in Central Europe, Eastern Europe, you know, you're Goths, Visigoths, Vandals, those types. And uh, because they weren't because they weren't as organized and um, a quote unquote modern military operation the way um, Rome was, when they would set off on a big campaign, it was like uprooting a whole village. Men, women, children, the elderly, farm animals, like packing up housing structures, everything, moving everything in unison uh, south toward, uh, toward Rome. And in the morning, they would slaughter a pig. And uh, they wouldn't butcher it the same way. You know, you wouldn't do it into, you know, threes, into third primals and stuff like that. What they would do is take the whole, like, lower, the plate, the navel plate off of the pig, which would basically be the, the lower part of the, of the ribs and all that belly into just like a big raft of meat. And then you'd get your pikes, you know, you know pikes um, in Braveheart whenever they're like, wait, wait, hold, hold, and then grab the pikes and up, you know, as like uh, javelins. So you take your pike and you drive that down into the ground and then you would just take that big floppy mass of meat and drape it over the pike. And in the center, you just have a big fire and you might have a dozen or so of these pikes with, you know, 20, 30 pounds of pork draped over them, um, slowly roasting and smoking throughout the day. And then whenever the people return from their campaign, whether if they're victorious and they're celebrating or if they, if they lost and they're, you know, nursing their wounds and, and trying to deal with the agony of defeat, then uh, they have a nutritionally dense meal waiting for them whenever they get back. And that cut, like that basically navel plate of pork, was, um, was called the Rippespeer, right? It was the rib spear, because it was, it was a rib section that was cooked on a spear. It was a spear rib. And then over, you know, 1700 years, more or less, of evolution and bastardization, the Rippespeer, the spear rib, becomes the spare rib. And that sounds pretty cool. That sounds like it could be accurate, possibly. <laughs> All right, so next up, what we're going to do is we're going to remove the chine bone. We were a little off-center with uh, bifurcating this pig. So uh, we'll be real careful with not going too deep. But basically, our ribs end right in this area here. So we're going to make a cut real up close to the, to the vertebrae, kind of, kind of on its side like this. And we're going to get in. That's why we want to take that tenderloin out first, because otherwise we're just going to grind that into a puddle of mush. So we're going to cut through that. And then we're going to basically remove this spine section off of here, which will leave the pork loin at the top adhered to the belly and these ribs here. And then, you know, without the, without the vertebral, without the vertebral junction <laughs> or whatever it's called at the top of the ribs, what we can do is just come in with a knife in between each rib bone and cut a nice bone in pork chop from that. Okay. So that's the idea. Hopefully the sawing goes as easily as it did on the front, on the bottom half. I'm gonna clean up some of this stuff here because this is basically just gonna go into trim. It's just some of the, the leaf lard and, and little flaps of, of muscle that were under the uh, tenderloin. Pull some of this stuff off so that it's not gumming up the, uh, why don't you look at that? Let's get this little bone out of here. Um, so that it's not gumming up the saw blade. Here we go. So we lay this in here, and again, we'll stop once we can hear that we're no longer in bone. There we go. Now, Now what we can do is we'll take this off. We're going to tie up. Ah, that's what I don't have. I don't have my, my twine. We're going to tie this up as like a, a pork loin roast. We'll do it with the belly on the outside. 
we'll tie that up there. We'll take this lower portion of pork belly off for bacon and we'll do it. We'll leave about an inch of bone still like uncovered from the pork belly. Come straight across like this, dip the knife down, run right along the bones. There we go. And there we go. This will be this will be bacon. In this rack here, we will clean it up a little bit and make these into our pork chops. All right. Dip in right in here. And what we're going to do is see hopefully you can see this. Um, we have one rib here, one rib here. So if we come right down in between there, It'll give us a nice even cut thickness. Beautiful. There we go. There. Pork chop number one. Pork chop number two. See, just, I mean, we're, we're only one third of our, of the way through one half of this pig and already like I'm so greasy and slippery that it's hard to, hard to control, not hard to control, but, um, you got to really stay focused on how you're holding your knife, what move, your, move you're making with the knife so that it doesn't slip on you. Also, man, these tables, if they were just like six inches taller, it'd be so much better. I'm like such, such a hunchback after working down on this surface all day, you know? But here we go. That's beautiful. Get a fire going in the grill. Beautiful. Yeah, we'll just make this one a double thick. We'll have that tonight. All right. That guy over here. All right. So that basically our loin primal Let's get all of our sausage trim and stuff that's going to move over here what i am going to do is i'm going to move these out of the way put them in the corner of the other table over there before i start working on the next uh section here okay 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 we moved all that stuff out of the way we're going to break down our shoulder primal um yeah i mean there's a lot of different ways to do this the way we're going to do it we're going to remove the copa off the top because we will cure that and make a uh, copa seca, copa picante, maybe like a caraway copa, something like that. That is a wonderful bundle of muscles that kind of think of them as like tributaries that sort of consolidate into the loin muscle as it runs down the back. Uh, you know, whenever people think about like the natural state or the, like when you think about a cut of meat that best reflects the um the nature of the animal that you're that you're eating you know like I, I think with beef is like the strip loin or the short loin or even both like basically the loin primal of, of beef with those big big ribs the the ten, the tenderloin obviously on one side and the the new york strip uh running down the other side you can obviously cut into porterhouses and t-bones at one end or you can do them separately However, that seems to me as like indicative of like, this is, this is the essence of, of beef is this, uh, is this primal with pigs. I think a lot of people would, would err on the side of like the ham being the essence of the pig because it's the sort of the highest profile cut of meat, I think, um, on, on a pig. But my argument is for the pork shoulder, particularly the copa muscles, because, because the pig is this like forest dwelling understory omnivore that is very strong, very adaptive, um, will eat a wide variety of forage, um, everything from like insects, grubs, uh, worms, small rodents and lizards, stuff like that, up to, you know, grasses, roots, nuts, obviously mast, like acorns, hazelnuts, beech nuts, walnuts, all that kind of stuff. Um, all the way up to, you know, I mean, you can feed a, you can feed a pig, a rotisserie chicken and they will love it because it's fantastic. But, um, 
their ability to just like as a bulldozer just turn over the sod and look through the the fermented and decaying leaf litter um, you know acorns that fell in years past all that kind of stuff the, the, their ability to dig a trench is unparalleled and as this is like the hydraulic system to drive that big uh, strong head so i think that the uh, pork shoulder is uh, it expresses the pigness of the pig <laughs> to borrow to borrow from Joel Salatin. All right, so again, we are going to start at the top here with the Copa muscle. And this one, see, where we started off, we were a little bit on this side of the pig because we, we don't have the feather bones from the spine poking up there, which arguably makes this a little easier. Uh, we might just have an oddly shaped Copa, but it doesn't really matter that much because once it's cured and it goes into like a, um, I don't know, a, a, beef bla a beef bung or a hog middle or something like that, to hang and dry, it'll be tied up, it'll be trussed nice and tight to make it like long and log shaped. So um, you know, any little wonkiness in its raw state is not that big of a deal. So we're gonna actually just, um, because we don't have to worry about these feather bones, I'm just gonna cut horizontally straight across. And we're gonna go down until, kind of until we, uh, you know, right in there feel the, um, the shoulder blade, the clavicle. And like, I'm, I'm I'm not sawing so much as just tapping that knife against there to show that that's where the clavicle is. It's more of, it's not a visual aid, it's more of like a, um, uh, uh, a tex te textural aid, I don't know, um, for myself. And then, so once we hit that clavicle, what we do is we wanna like, we'll come in like this until we hit the bone, go sideways, and then trim that meat away from the bone um, horizontally, it's kind of like it's kind of like horizontal fracking. You know, you dig down until you hit that that shale layer, and then you tip the <laughs> tip the the drill bit on its side. I don't know how it actually works, but that's how I'm describing it. All right, let me just very gently, because this is you can very easily cut yourself. And you look, if you cut yourself, it's not the end of the world. It's not even the end of your butchery for the for the day. If you need to if you need to bandage it up or something, you can do that. But if you can avoid cutting yourself to begin with, oh boy, it just makes everything easier. Okay, let me just drag the knife right through there. Boop, and then we have our copa It'll come off. Yeah, we we really. <laughs> mangled it a little bit, but it'll it'll come together fine. We'll leave this fat cap on because as we cinch that down and consolidate this into um, the copa shape, whenever it's drying, whenever you slice this, you'll get nice little um, cross sections that are really beautiful, like a stained glass window made of dry cured pork. Uh, copa, uh, different words for it, copa, capicola, even though some capicola is actually like a cooked salami, but capicola can also be, you know, the copa, the copa product, uh, the copa. I call it the, the muscle group. The copa. Also, gabagool is like a um, uh, an Americanized bastardization of of the capicola or, or copa seca, copa picante, whatever. Um, I think it was a thing where it's like um, people in New York City or Philadelphia or wherever we have a bunch of Italian immigrants. They're going to the Italian deli and they have the products that they are. You know, they know from the old world and the people who don't speak Italian, it just sounds like a bunch of like, uh, I don't know, they buy something down there called gabagool and uh, it just got um, like adopted into the language, got assimilated. Um, so a lot of times you hear gabagool used interchangeably with copa or capicola, yada, 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 yada. Okay, so what we're going to do now, so we're going to move, remove um, what what remains of the spine and the neck bones here, um, the first four, four or five ribs or whatever we have left here, and the sternum. This will all come off as like one plate that can just be removed. The reason for that, and I, I, I like, I, I suspect that this is true because I don't physically see um, it falsified, you know, in the inside of the thousands of pigs that I've been in this position with. But I don't know that quadrupedal mammals have 
clavicles in the same way that we do. Clavicle being the collarbone that kind of like, kind of like a, is it like a tie rod in a car? <laughs> sort of like connects the shoulder to the sternum and gives you like that, that broad, you know, arms out at the sides uh, type of stature. Um, cats, you know, cats can fit through very small holes because they don't have to contend with a, you know, basically like an, an antler-like structure inside of their chest the way that we do. Um, but because of that, there's nothing really connecting the shoulder out here to the ribs in here the way there is with a human. So that makes it easier. I'm, I'm glad that they, uh, I'm glad they decided to make the pigs that way because it, it, it's definitely easier to, to remove this than if you had to contend with like some random bone um, running perpendicular to the whole shebang. Anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry, I do. It is, it is weird going through this whole spiel like by myself. Oh, this is where we came in. We started um, down with, the, with the, the saw and we were way inside here. So we can just cut this piece of pork shoulder off and add it to the sausage bin. And then the lower part of these uh, bones or the rest of this, you know, we'll, we'll get that cleaned up also. That will also become part of the sausage experience. So again, we're just using the bone as like a guide for the knife to run right alongside these, um, these rib bones. We'll catch a little bit of that neck there, okay? And just kind of use a little bit, it's not gravity, I guess it's more tension by wrenching it in one direction and cutting it, we can lift it off there. All right, so. And then in here we have some, some blood clots, like this would be, I guess, the jugular coming out into the neck and that would run up alongside, alongside the larynx and you know, up under the chin, into the jaw, into the brain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This bottom part here would essentially be the pork brisket. You know, uh, and I've, I've, I've prepared pork brisket the same way you would do beef brisket. And it's not bad, but it's also not as good as beef brisket. Oh, we still got, we still got a little bit of his skin attached down here. Let's just trim this off real quick so we don't end up with those hairs everywhere. Here we go. A little piece of skin. We'll toss it back in the trailer. All right. So. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna remove, um, this is basically the pressa here that sits inside of the, uh, the shoulder blade. And I left this on here whenever I remove the copa. It can come off as part of the copa. It can make a real nice, big, meaty copa, but it's also this wonderful cut of pork for grilling on over wood fire. I'll probably make this tonight. If we just cut off this part of the loin, and then come right across the bottom. And we'll trim it up so that it's nice and symmetrical. But this is the pressa. And see, if we clean it up a little bit and push it over, you can see the, the muscle fibers, they kind of, they run in one direction, but they kind of dive across like this, which means that whenever you cook this, if you cut it um, at an angle, I guess this way, um, directly perpendicular to the muscle fibers, it's very, it's tender in the way that like a New York strip steak is tender. It has a nice like mouth feel and, and meatiness to it, but it's not chewy per se. Um, it's also because it was like sandwiched, it's pressed between um, the shoulder blade and like the interior part of the shoulder. It had really, really sufficient blood supply. So it has like a nice beefy red texture to it or color, not texture, color. Um, so that gives it a lot of great flavor. So we'll trim up all the surface stuff off of here, you know, the silver skin or whatever. Salt and pepper, and that'll go on the grill. Um, cook that to like a, to a hard medium, like a medium to almost to the borderline of medium well, and you'll, you'll have a nice pink center, um, very juicy, delicious, and um, it just tastes very beefy. It tastes, it tastes like, a, like a nice, like a nice, a nice steak. <laughs> but it is pork. It, I promise that there are no cow parts inside of this pig whatsoever. All right, now what we're going to do, let's trim up some of this, um, just this junk that'll go into our sausage bin eventually. Um, that's, that's the thing too, is like at night, tonight, we'll be inside and just sitting there with a small knife and maybe 
throw a, a movie up on the iPad or something or a podcast and we're just going to be tr breaking down all this sausage trim and getting them into like between one and three pound bags of trim so that whenever we come back in and make fresh sausages, linked sausages, um, uh, dry cured sausages like salamis and soprasada and stuff like that, um, we'll ha already have everything um, measured up the way that we need. It's like, oh, I need five pounds. I get two one pound bags, one three pound bag and go to town. Now, what I'm going to do here is because like you can, we can make like a roast, um, like a shoulder roast or a picnic cam or any number of different things here. I'm mostly going to just get this, um, this shoulder blade out and then cut the bottom uh, off. Basically, we'll make, we'll make a small like a picnic cam roast and then a lot of this is going to go into trim. Um, basically, I'm going to be giving away one of my hams because I have two pigs. That's four traditional size hams. Um, one of them I'm going to give to my neighbors as a going away present because they're moving. And, uh, and then the other ones, you know, make one for Christmas, one for Easter, and then we'll have a third one where it's like, all right, we'll see if anybody in the family needs a ham. If not, uh, maybe we'll break it down and just keep that for like lunch meat or something like that. So I don't need to make a bunch of like front leg hams uh, just because I don't have a use for them. So that's why I'm not going to spend a lot of time like kind of perfectly shaping and, and breaking down this shoulder. But what we are going to do is remove this shoulder blade um, and then we'll trim it up later. But it has some muscle attached to it here. So the shoulder blade shaped like a shovel down in here it's like this and it kind of comes down to a handle and it terminates with a uh, like a, the socket joint and then the what would it be the humerus like the upper arm bone of the pig comes up and it terminates in a ball and they come together like this that junction is going to be right in this area here and one of the ways you can tell kind of where it's going to be is like where you have a lot of things coming together you have muscles right here that kind of run in this direction and then you have a bunch of um, blood vessels see where like you got like all this coagulated blood right here you actually have a blood vessel poking out um, but you have that here you have this part that comes across here and then you have something that, so it's like you can tell that there's an intersection right in here um, where that joint probably is um, but what i'm going to do before i get down there I could, I could go straight into there but then i have to do more i'm going to um, try to get under and clean up some of the face of this uh, of this bone before we get to the actual uh, joint that's buried down there. Just because it, it, it will make it a little easier um, cleaning that up and getting it out. All right. We can pull this off and put it in with the sausage trim. There we go. And here's our uh, uh, shoulder, what should we call it? Shoulder joint, sorry. It's like you're try trying to like just poke around and try to find the words at the same time and you can't recruit the two sides of your brain to do uh, separate tasks um, at once. So you see where like all these blood vessels are and the joint kind of starts down here. But so what we can do is just make a cut straight across and open this up. Maybe take a take like a cube of meat out of here so that we can see the entirety of this bone. And I'm trying to like cut this um, like the tendons and stuff away from the bone um, as close as possible. So it's like trying to get a pinch on that so you can pull it up and cut this out. Got a nice tendon right here. But then as as you do this, it kind of oh it's like. It's like a bag that surrounds the, um, the joint and then inside you have some of that fluid that like lubricates the joint and softens the, softens the impact between two different bones or whatever. And I don't know if, you, if, it's pick, if my microphone is picking up that grinding, but this is like one of those examples of where you want to have a flexible knife because you can get it in there, you can articulate it a little bit without having to worry about snapping a point off. And then I also like to say this is a good reason for um, getting Victorinox knives because doing this with a $30 boning knife is not that big of a deal. But doing this with like a $130 boning knife, it's like, ah, oh, jeez. 
start second guessing yourself. You start trying to be delicate about it when you really you need to get in there. You need to grip it and rip it. So I always say that sound, that sound that you hear is a hundred dollar knife turning into a thirty dollar knife. So just start with the thirty dollar knife to begin with. Now there's definitely, there are benefits, um, aesthetics, uh, the user experience, you know, for for the nicer knives. But if you're just starting out and you really, your your interest is just in breaking apart the, the pig, like you're more interested in what's happening down here than what's happening in your hand, then, you know, start with some cheap knives. You don't have to go out and break the bank just to make meat for the first couple of times, you know? See if it's something you enjoy and then, and then break the bank. <laughs> All righty. So we're just freeing this guy up, this little shovel of meat. And what's, what further complicates it, this side of the, of the shoulder blade is flat. The other side kind of goes like this. It makes like a ridge down the middle. And of course there's muscle attached all along that ridge. So we're just gonna, that's gonna be most of the trimming is the other side of this guy. So we'll just come in here, kind of cut a wedge shape along either side of that ridge. And then we'll just pull this whole muscle, or not muscle, this whole bone out. There we go. Because we can just cut all this off. It's not gonna be used for anything else. But here's our, um, uh, the shoulder blade. Pop this, there. Here's the top ridge of it. It gets kind of cartilaginous as it gets to the end, but down in here, it's solid bone. And then on this side, we have that ridge that run, runs up the middle. We'll cut this stuff off and we'll have a nice clean bone afterwards. And this is where that came out of. Let's see if we point, the, ugh, see how slippery everything is? Point this in here. This is that, that ball joint um, that is the top of that, that humerus. So at this point, what we're gonna do, I think, I'm just gonna cut right across at what is essentially the elbow and we'll take this top part off. We might have to trim up some of that flap stuff, but what we can do is we can, we can wrap it around this roast and tie it up, which I do have to go get a ball of twine because I'm gonna have some other tying to do as we go through here. But once it's all tied up, tied up it'll be a nice, a nice little bone-in roast. Uh, you could cure it as a ham, um, but yeah, whatever, whatever you wanna use. I don't need it as a ham, so I'm not gonna cure it, but we'll come in right here. See, back here is our like elbow bone we just kind of cut down and around here and i am going to use the saw for this you could come in and find the elbow joint and kind of in between um, the bones but since i really don't even care to have this cut for anything um, i'm just doing it for the sake of doing it we'll use the saw There we go, we'll trim up that trotter. Let's see how we'll do this. I think, yeah, this big big hunk here and over. So we'll, we'll tie that up and we'll basically cut this off right here and then we'll have a roughly ham shaped ham slash roast in the front. All right. Now for this trotter, um, I am gonna skin this down to about the wrist and then cut this off so that we have uh, a shank there. Um, so pork shanks, a lot of times people will brine those and smoke those and then use that essentially as an ingredient in like ham and bean soup or beans and greens or something like that. And that's great. There's a lot of collagen and connective tissue that will uh, impart like a, a velvety sort of richness to whatever you cook it in, as well as the fact that, you know, when you brine it and smoke it, it's going to have a ton of flavor that it will give up to, uh, to a braising liquid or whatever. However, however, sorry, I'm all out of breath from sawing. I'm, I'm in the best shape of my life. I really am, but trying to talk and do this at the same time, I forget that I have to breathe occasionally. There is a product that you can make with this called Tonno di Miale, and uh, Italian to English translation, tuna pork, you know? And it doesn't sound it sounds like something that like a demented lunch lady would come up with, you know, tuna pork, tuna surprise, mystery meat, whatever. What it is is in northern Italian or in northern Italy, in the like the foothills, foothills of the Alps, you know, in the um, 
in the, the breadbasket of Italy, I guess you would call it. Um, you have a lot of pigs, but you don't have access to the sea. You know, it's far away from the Mediterranean. Um, so it's a, it's a pork-centric culture as opposed to your southern Italy, your more Mediterranean um, cuisine and, and lifestyle and stuff like that. So, you know, down in southern Italy, in the islands off the coast thereof, in the, I don't know if it's in the spring or the fall or whatever, but they have like this big tuna hunting thing where, <laughs> God, <laughs> I, talk, I talk about this with such, with such conviction, um, but, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not really sure on the details, but the, the overall gist still holds. But people go out on, on, on uh, not canoes, but rowboats, and they drop these nets down so they hang vertically in the water, in the water column. So they create like these corridors of nets. And the nets, I believe, are sewn together at the bottom so that, you know, they might be real deep over here, but then as you come, the net kind of guides up to the surface. And then they, they herd, for lack of a better word, tuna into these corridors. And the tuna swim along, and as they start running up against the net, they have to come up, 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 and eventually they come up to the surface where men in rowboats await to beat them to death with clubs, hook them, and pull them into, into the boat. Lots and lots of tuna available. Uh, lots of seafood in southern Italy that is not available in northern Italy. So what we do with uh, the pigs, the tuna of the, of the field, as they are, <laughs> Sorry, that was stupid. Um, what we'll do is we will basically seam out all these little individual forearm muscles off of this shank and pack it in salt for 24 hours. And when I say pack it in salt, I mean, for a lot of curing, I like to do equilibrium curing where you're measuring out the weight of the meat and then you're doing like 2.5% or 2.75% or maybe 3% of salt given you know the the mass of the meat that you're curing with this you put it in a glass dish on a bed of salt and then you just pack it salt box it's solid you know you might use three pounds of salt for a big batch of uh tonno di miale <clears throat> 24 hours in the fridge in that salt that salt is going to draw a lot of the water content out of the muscles leaving the myoglobin, which is like your red um, protein-rich pigmentation, like a, kind of like the, the fluid that's in the muscle fibers, leaving that behind. So it's going to concentrate not only the flavor um, and, the, and the, like the protein by drawing water out of it, but it's also going to concentrate that color to the point where it's going to be like almost purple after 24 hours when you take it out of the salt. Take it out, rinse it off real quick into a high-sided pot with cool, fresh water, white wine and a handful of bay leaves and simmer that for four hours covered okay just just on a simmer so it's like slow cooking that in this white wine bay infused liquid and then you kill the heat and let it sit covered on the stove overnight so it'll cool in that liquor uh, there will be a lot of like gelatin in there that will um, like in the next day that that uh that pot will be like basically pork jelly with all these little pieces in there. Pull them out, get, get all, the, all the gelatin off of the meat. And then um, with your knife, let's see, let me clean this up a little bit. You get this like little morsel of meat. Uh, let me find a morsel of meat here like this. And it'll be this stuff that is cured and been simmered and everything. And what you do is you kind of just fluff it open like all those um, muscle fibers, you can kind of just separate them and fluff them up a little bit like a cotton ball, like, you know, expanding a cotton ball. And then you put them in pint jars or half pint jars, fill them with like the best olive oil that you can get. One bay leaf in there, put the lid on. It's, they're not gonna be like pressure canned or hot water bath canned or anything like that. So you have to keep them in the refrigerator but that oil will completely permeate um, that, that meat in just like the, the bright citrusy essence of, of the white wine, the background flavor of, of the bay leaf, and the saltiness of the cured pork all kind of come together with that, that fluffed out texture to give you something that is remarkably simmer, similar to canned tuna. And I love to use that, you know, take it out of the jar, drain the oil off of it, toss it with a little bit of mayo, um, celery, celery greens especially, like the celery leaves, and some uh, red onion, like just um, uh, diced red onion, 
and it's like a fantastic uh, tuna salad for crackers. Favorite thing in the world. Um, unfortunately, the name in English is tuna pork, but <laughs> you know, you say, Tolly, would you like a, would you like some hors d'oeuvres? We have tonneau de miale, and they're like, oh my god, it's so fancy. I don't even know what it is, but sure, it's delicious. But anyway, um, I'll work on that. We don't need, you don't need to watch me sit here and and, and skin a pork trotter. Especially when we have a whole ham primal to get into over here. Let's move our copa out of the way and our pressa out of the way. We'll be grilling that pressa tonight along with some pork chops so we can just throw it over there. All right, here is our ham primal. Couple things about this. One is it's called a ham primal, but it is not, it is not ham yet. Um, it might be the ham cut it contained inside of this primal, um, but it has to be cured and smoked, brined and smoked or whatever um, before it's properly ham. But what we have here is we have our coccyx, like our tailbone or what's left of it on this side of it um, at the top. The pelvic bone is in the middle. Uh, the femur runs uh, you know, inside of the ham, and then you get down into this, um, basically the ankle. The knee joint is buried in the middle here, which actually will be relevant uh, shortly. But what we need to do to create a ham, a ham-shaped ham, so to speak, is remove um, the pelvic bone from there. And what we call, we call it the H bone, A-I-T-C-H, not like the letter, letter H. But it's, um, you know, just like in the shoulder, you have a ball and socket joint. The femur comes up and it ends in a ball. The pelvic, you know, we have half of the pelvis on here, half of the pelvis is on the other side. It ends in the socket and it grips it like this. What makes that, this joint a little bit more complicated to, um, to break apart and separate than the shoulder joint was is one, there's a lot more mass around it. Like there's more muscle, more connective tissue, all kinds of stuff. It's just a bigger part of the animal down here. Um, additionally, um, the musculature and the, um, the tendons, the ligaments, they're stronger. They're like more robust than what's in the front because while like the mass in the front of the animal is basically to help the head lift over things on the ground like sod and rocks and whatever, the, uh, the mass at the back of the animal is important for propelling it forward and, and driving this you know, heavy animal up hills, you know, uh, an anchor against which it can, it can brace itself to turn over the sod or whatever. So basically, it's just it's a more robust joint. Additionally, there is a cord of like a connective, um, a connective bundle of tissue in the center of, I guess uh, it would be this side of the, um, of the socket that connects the, uh, the, the, the ball joint of the femur into there. It's kind of like um, uh, tent poles, how they have that paracord in the middle. So they're like two pieces of the tent pole can, are connected and it's not until they kind of go together that they become rigid, sort of like that, okay? So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna um, cut right across here to find that H bone and free the pelvic bone from the rest of the ham. Then we'll just trim off uh, the parts of the, of the coccyx and the, the bottom of the spine and pull that out. That'll get trimmed up. Um, we can take a sirloin roast off of this side, which is basically like a horseshoe crab shaped uh, end part of the loin. So you can take that off, tie it up, maybe three or four trusses along to make a nice you know, long roast. And then, um, then we'll do some stuff with the ham to make it uh, ham shaped. <laughs> but same, same deal as up in the, in the shoulder. You look down here, you can tell that right in this area is a junction of lots of different muscle groups. You have like the top, you know, part of the sirloin coming down here, the ham muscles come up here. You have things in the groin and the, the, um, the tenderloin that come in it this way. And they all kind of center around this mass, this intersection. And there's also, also the femoral artery will terminate right in this area as well. I think it's right here. Sometimes though it has tension on it. So like whenever you're cutting these pieces off of the, 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 the parent uh, mass, you know, the, the animal itself, that, that arter the artery, when it's severed, it'll like kind of slink back and shrink down into the, into the ham. But if we were doing, if we were making a prosciutto, a dry cured ham out of this, number one, we leave the skin on, we'd scald and scrape it instead of skinning it because that creates a, a nice you know, waterproof barrier and uh, like a protective coating for, for the, 
the process when we're, we dry it. You hang it to dry for anywhere from 18 months to three or four years. Um, but what we would do is with our forearm, massage the inside of the leg and push up like this so that if there's, if there's, oh, there we go, it popped right over here. Um, <clears throat> let's see if I can show it to you. Right here, you get this line of blood coming out of the, the femoral artery. A lot of times, th that this will get severed close, like more in this area. So it, it would be right here, but because we we halved it a little off center, it's it's buried. It's right down in here. So the femoral artery, you can push some of that blood out of it. Um, you can also with your injector, you know, because if, if you have an injector for making brined hams, put a little bit of salt water in there, find the open end of the femoral artery, squirt a little bit of that salt water down there and then push it back out. That'll flush the blood out. Reason being is that blood is a great medium for pathogen growth, bacteria, fungus, rot essentially. And you know, if you're gonna cure, you're gonna make a prosciutto, you're gonna cure this in salt for 30 days and it will be refrigerated, but then you're gonna hang it at above refrigeration level for an extended period of time. Like I said, 18 months to three years. If you've got blood sitting in that artery down in the middle of your ham, there's a good chance that it, it will rot. It might not spread through the whole ham. You might just have an inch of like a rotting channel running through the middle of your ham. It's unpleasant, it's unsanitary, and it can turn you off to the rest of it. I mean, like all of this in the back would be good, but man, if you cut into that first and you just see like gray, green, putrid, disgusting rot running down the middle of your prosciutto, even knowing that it's probably okay over here, you're not really gonna be too, it's not gonna be appetizing to you. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut kind of across this way through this mass, and we're gonna open this up a little bit so that we can find that, um, that H-bone junction. And see, our hip bone where we, where we tapped through it with the, uh, with the cleaver when we had to split the pelvis is right here. Um, so if we go like just inside of that, um, we can kind of, come at like an angle here, just like this, and see what we've got going in here. And what, uh, this is what I'm looking for, but, I, and I hope, I hope we can show it here. I hope you'll be able to see it. But right where my finger is, that is the ball joint at the top of the femur. So our, our, the cup that sits on it is right here going in. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna cut around this and free that, that, that joint up a little bit. And that liquid that comes out of there, again, is just like, a, it's like a lymphatic or some sort of liquid that's in the, jo in the joint to cushion it and, and whatever. But this is like, I'm gonna go in around the, the ball joint like this to sever that cord. There we go, and I did that just now. And I could feel it by pushing down on this part of the pelvis. It's like as soon as that cord severed, I got like maybe another millimeter of, of play there. So I know that I, I did that correctly. And then we come down, we're basically just going to, like we wanna cut this off straight like this because all of this above here is the sirloin. So we're gonna come sh just straight down to free up um, basically the top portion of this whole ham structure. We're just cutting through like the uh, membrane that surrounds that joint right now. Dip in here, come straight across. Beautiful. All right, we'll turn that into a sirloin roast. And this was really nice. The, the flatter you can make that cut, the better. And this was nice and flat here. We'll trim a little bit of this off. What we do whenever we, when we end up with an actual ham shaped ham, I like to try to think of this as the top point and everything, uh, you know, this, this bone as being the, the peak of the ham and everything sort of just falling away from it. So we'll trim back here, 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 whatever. So that's like the apex, but having a nice flat cut over here is really nice. We'll come back to the ham in a moment. There's one more like really, really interesting cut that we need to make on that. Um, <clears throat> but I like to do it last. So here we go. We have the socket joint for the pelvis, um, part of the pelvic bone. All these parts of the bone probably have names. And I just did uh, one of these butchery clinics with a, a guy who's a, 
chiropractor. So he was, he was fun because he knew what all this stuff was called. <laughs> and I was just like, it's an H bone, part of your ham. You know, it's like a cartoon bone where it comes up and it has like the little heart shape in it on one side. And he was like, oh yeah, so that's actually the, uh, the humeral head or the femoral head and the yada, yada, yada. Anyway, um, so, so, not to reminisce over the last pig that I cut up. We're cutting up with this pig. I gotta give it my undivided attention. So what we're gonna do is we're going to um, come right along the where the tail is and cut down and then around. We're gonna pull this off and that 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 flap of of loin and all these little sub muscle groups from the ham will still be connected uh, and then we'll tie that up into a nice uh, roast shaped roast to go with our ham shaped ham. Alrighty, we got, yeah, it's, it, whenever you, <laughs> it's amazing, whenever you um, end up like one or two inches off on the sawzall cut that splits it in half, sometimes it's like, what the heck is this here? It's just, it's part of the vertebrae that's uh, cut in a strange uh, direction. But um, the, 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 the key to getting like a nice sirloin roast off of here is to, you know, have this fat cap intact because that will serve as the top of the roast when we tie it and when you put that in the oven <clears throat> when you put that in the oven with the fat side up it just melts and base the uh the, the roast as it drips down around it so you have that nice big fat cap you have a better roast than if you don't and then we're just going to follow these around and try to tuck in close there and then this all will be trimmed up for sausage oh, I got this little bone here there we go it's not it's not as difficult to cut out of there as it looks it's just because my hands are so slippery but anyway we put this together and we'll cinch it down we'll do one two three four maybe five ties and then we'll cut off this end to square it up and cut this end to square it up there whenever you tie a roast like that, um, the reason is to normalize the uh, density from like one end to the other. I mean, we, we'll, we'll square it off by cutting off this little flap here and this little flap here. Um, but, you know, if one part has like two muscles with some connective tissue or separating membrane in between them here, and then one muscle over here, this would cook a lot faster. So by cinching them together and tying them up and really um, tying them down like this, it makes it much that this will be much closer to the density and thickness as this end and uh it'll cook more evenly it's wonderful all right i got my barn cats out here watching me they're trying to figure out how to get up onto the table so if a cat jumps up um, i will shoo it away and edit it out of the video <laughs> but who cares i mean this is just for me to eat if, if i don't mind having <sighs> kitty cats around my pork then why should anybody else? All right, so uh, now, this is fun. This, this part, well, not a magic trick, but this is one of those parts that uh, makes me apprehensive every single time I do it because I know that it's not fraught with danger. It's just there's a possibility of me looking like I don't know what the heck I'm, I'm doing. And that is, I alluded to it earlier, the knee joint of this is buried way up in here. It's kind of like, um, we're used to like the articulation of our limbs from a human standpoint, but then you see other animals and you're like, wow, like, like a horse, for example. A horse is running on its tiptoes, like on its fingernails. That's what its hooves are. And the part where you think is a horse's knee is actually like its ankle, like its foot is really long and, and vertical like this and they're standing on their on their toes so their ankle is way up where you think the knee is and then the second point of articulation in their leg is where the knee is um, and it's usually a lot higher than what you expect same thing with the pig this thigh up here it terminates into the knee which is right here like this is not the knee this is um, essentially the the, um, the the ankle because that's where the achilles tendon is so what we need to do Without using the saw, we're going to take the lower leg and remove it from the upper leg. We can do that because if you, if you look at this, this should be apparent on video. This mu whole muscle mass, there's a dividing line right here. You know, this stuff right here is different than this stuff right here. So right here 
is like the line of demarcation between the lower leg and the upper leg. So what we do is we hold it up like this and we come down right in here at like a 45 degree angle, kind of terminating right into this, following this line. What my knife should terminate right in the back of the knee and I should be able to see all that musculature in there. If that's the case, coming with the boning knife, all you have to do is cut a couple tendons, sort of that, that surrounding fascia around the joint, and then cut through the front you know, part, the quadricep essentially, um, and the bottom part of the leg will come off of the top, and you don't have to use the bone saw, which is nice. So we're gonna come in below the skin, just uh, because it's, it's there. Like, I mean, I would probably come in a little higher like this, but I'll come in this way. And then as I cut in, I'll dive, I'll, I'll turn the knife and go in at the 45 degree angle so that we can come into that, hopefully that knee joint. Ah, perfect. And the reason why I say that it's fraught is that if you end up like an inch high or an inch low, but it's not clear, if you're high or low, like if you're just an inch off, but you don't know which way, you can be in here screwing around trying to find that joint for a long time, just bumping up against um, uh, bone. But you see, we came in, this, this, this part here is the upper leg, this part here is the lower leg, and this knife can come, you know, right in between the two. And that's basically, I mean, it doesn't get any cleaner than that. I probably could have just hacked that leg straight off with the with the breaking knife as I came in here, um, but I wanted to show it separately. So anyway, so this then becomes this is a ham. This is a ham shaped ham. Pop this off of here. This is real pretty. Um, this will probably uh, tomorrow will end up in the brine bucket injected. We'll we'll push out a lot of this uh, the blood clots from the femoral artery and whatnot. <laughs> We'll inject it very heavily, get it in a brine bucket for two to three weeks, and then we will smoke that um, in, in advance of Christmas, and we'll have a Christmas ham, and that'll be a beautiful Christmas ham. All right, and then the rest of this leg, same thing I'm gonna do there is I'll, I'll trim the skin down basically to, to the ankle below the, the, the tendon there, and we'll strip all that meat off for Tano di Miale, because it's wonderful. And that was uh, basically, that's half of a pig. Um, it's done. The other half I'm gonna do pretty much the same way. And then I'm gonna get my twine and we'll come back in and we'll tie up some roasts and maybe uh, we'll lay everything out at the end. But I'm not gonna go through the whole spiel uh, second time as we go through the second half of the pig. But one thing I would like to point out as you notice, I mean, obviously it just looks like carnage here. I, I don't have a cameraman today, it's just on a tripod. Sitting on top of a big pot that I use to boil sorghum syrup, which is also on top of a cage that I use to uh, gather my chickens whenever I process them. So I've got this whole like Rube Goldberg uh, set up there um, just to, to film this table. But, you know, it started off, it looked like half a pig. I mean, there were legs at either end and it just like was a cross section of the animal. But then every action that you apply to it, it starts, you know, and I always say whenever I process chickens, everything that you do from the point that you kill the bird um, makes it look less like a chicken and more like chicken. And what I mean by that is it goes from the, the animal that was running around in the yard to um, the food product that goes into the roasting pan or um, goes on the grill or whatever. Um, you know, every handful of feathers that you pull out, it looks less like the animal that it was and it looks more like the food that it's becoming. And the same thing, you know, you know with the pig. Uh, you know, right now it's basically <clears throat> a bunch of trim, ribs, pork chops, roasts, ham, stuff like that. Uh, I believe... <sighs> sort of like the artistry of butchery, like the, the not artistry, like the vocational, the, um, the, the trade of butchery, sort of di diverged from um, the, the business of animal agriculture. Uh, when would this be? Like after, after the Norman invasion of England, like AD 1066, what you had was, you know, the, the British Isles were very, um, it was like the backwater of, of Europe, and then Breton French came in and um, installed the French 
the French court, the French aristocracy, like French laws and tradition, and also like the the language, the French language was the language of of court of of the upper class. Of course, Latin was the language of the church, which was the upper echelon of society, and then that bled out into like law and medicine, kind of as as knock-on effects from the fact that you know most of the um, literate people would have been in the clergy to begin with. But then you have you know the movers and the shakers in French society and in now in British society, then speaking French, and then down in the vernacular, you know the vernacular, which I believe vernacular. Uh, traces its etymolo etymology back to the wearnap, which was like the um, stocking cap that freed slaves would wear in Rome, you know, to indicate that they are they are no longer uh, owned by somebody else, but that they also haven't established themselves as a free person. So the wearnap, the vernacular, the the language of the common people, was like English. It was Anglo-Saxon, and it may probably Celtic and Welsh and all those things uh, blended in there. Um, but what you saw was like a, uh, a divergence between the, the, the name of the animal, which kind of remained those Anglic anglicized words like um, cow, pig, cock, heart. Heart would have been like a heart deer, but it's like single, single syllables that are kind of, kind of rough, you know, kind of rudimentary. Pig, heart, cock. Like those are words that just sort of spew forth out of your mouth. But then once they've been killed, once that pig has been killed and somebody has taken a knife, you know, this is an industrial product. I mean, my God, to smelt iron in, you know, not even the Middle Ages, but like coming out of the, out of the dark age, like the, the old, I mean, you were, you're coming out of, out of Beowulf times. You're not in Middle English. You're still in Old English with letters that don't look like our modern letters at the time. But to make a knife out of metal, holy cow, you, that's like a Lamborghini from, you know, 1067. Once you've applied the trade of breaking down that animal from the thing that's just, you know, farting and, and pooping in the, in, the, in the grass to something that is fit for the king, or the Pope, or somebody important that they could dine upon it with all the, all the pomp and circumstance that goes into French style uh, dining traditions. Holy cow. Um, then, you, then you have an elevation in the product. It goes from pig to pork, which is a French word, you know, P-O-R-Q-U-E, I believe. Um, and with cow, cow, turns into boeuf, and then uh, cock becomes poultry and heart becomes venison it's like uh, uh, once a human has applied a particular set of skills to the raw materials then the raw material moves up a uh, social class and it goes from uh, the word that uh, uh, describes it as a living animal as something really rudimentary the society that is f being phased out um, and it is being uh, elevated to to the French vernacular, um, which is just a step up for the pig. I'm sure the pig would disagree. He'd probably rather not be strewn, strewn across a couple of tables and have his head still connected to his body and all of his stuff still inside of him and walking around farting and pooping in the grass. But unfortunately, that is not in the cards for Mr. Pig. All right, so we're going to end that here. And when we reconvene with a quick edit, um, we'll just see what our um, pro produce from this uh, butchery session is. All right. All right. So we uh, finished cutting up the other half of this pig, and we have everything laid out here nicely. Um, we have our two, these are our two hams that will be brined and turned into our holiday hams. Uh, these two things here, these are our sirloin roasts, which will be tied and wrapped separately, um, you know, packaged up separately, tied, and ready to go. Um, even one of them is a little thicker. We might be able to even butterfly that open and stuff it. This is going to be that shoulder roast that um, I'll trim down and just turn into a smaller, a smaller format roast, uh, tie it up, put it together. We have our, um, our tenderloins here, 
Uh, we have our pork chops, bone-in pork chops here, and then we come down, I did some boneless pork chops at the end of that one. The other boneless pork loin is this roast here that'll be tied and packaged. We have our two small racks of uh, what would be like spare ribs if they had belly on them. Uh, they're not baby back, they're not St. Louis style, but they're the lower portion of the rib section there. We have one of our presses that'll go on the grill tonight. We have our two copas that will be um, cured and uh, dried for capicola. And then we have our shanks here that will strip down to make um, tana de miale. And then we have uh, our pork belly that'll turn into bacon. But that's, this is it, this is our, our piggy. Of course, uh, I have a lot of bones. Um, I have a lug for sausage trim and then all the bones that need to be uh, cleaned up and stripped down of all the meat so that that can go into the sausage trim as well. And um, then we also have our head that we will be um, taking the jowls off, the tongue, um, the cheeks, and then maybe we'll strip the skull down uh, to just like the fascia and the little adherence uh, muscles along the jaw and everything. And maybe we'll make some head cheese out of that. But there we go, there's one pig down. And what is, what is interesting is when I'm not talking through it, like the other half, uh, 20 minutes, man. Knock that out in 20 minutes, easy breezy beautiful. All right, so there's some wonderful pork that we'll be enjoying this evening.